Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 396, the Royal Wedding Edition. I'm Yanni. And I am Laurel. And we're the Hardy Boys. Yeah. <laughs> and today is May 18th, 2018. Okay, obviously we're speaking of the biggest trend this week, whether or not you hear Yanni or Laurel, and you got to hear both. Isn't that cool? We solved the technical issues. Um, George, I saw on Facebook, uh, your daughter graduated college this week. Congratulations. Yes, daughter number one graduated yeah. from Emory on Monday, and she had a wonderful time. She's off in Thailand right now, but before she left, Kevin, our daughter, who's a vegan, asked that be taken out for celebratory lunch. How much? So we they? went. We went to a lovely vegan restaurant in Atlanta, and without alcohol, it cost me a hundred dollars. Kevin, how do beans cost that much? Oh, Come on, salad. Uh, uh. And if they didn't even serve soda. They didn't even. Serve, yeah, uh, the the waitress. Uh, uh, Waiters and waitresses at these vegan restaurants are not the sort of models of human health and vigor that you sort of want to aspire to. If, if you eat here, I don't want to look like you. No. But uh, but uh, they said, well, we don't sell Coke or Pepsi products. We have our own range of homemade uh, soft drinks, cucumber, kale. And my daughter had a $6 kale soda. <laughs> Uh, which I think is kale in a blender, yes. soda water. <laughs> oh my God. But it's <sighs> organic, herbally uh, loved with, you know, with Buddhist chanting in the background as it's grown or something. I don't know. Guaranteed to keep the insides clean. Oh my gosh, that's bad. Well, Kevin, I just love living here in Hooterville in the country where, you know, your your choices are, if, if you really want something exotic, you get a Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, no, you go to any uh, restaurant in the South, uh, in South of Mason Dixieland, you go in and they ask you what you want for uh, your drink. And you say, I'll take a Coke. They'll say, what kind? I want Coke. Okay. But they think it's Seven Up. They want to know if it's Dr. Pepper. They want to know, you know, Coke is not the answer they're looking for. They want more details. Now, if you said Pepsi, they would, you don't want that. No, that's that's racism in the South, right there. George, let's move on. We have a couple talk topics, topics we want to talk about. Um, first, you know, we're, this whole theme here is going to be the royal wedding. There's been a lot of stories leading up to this royal wedding. Um, makeup, dress, is Harry ready? What will Meghan Markle's father uh, be alive for this uh, to watch the service on TV? All these types of things. And then there's a couple religion stories because if you know or don't know, uh, Meghan Markle was specially baptized uh, uh, recently. Uh, and confirmed. And confirmed uh, by Archbishop Justin Welby. Good job. And uh, a lot of people who are journalists don't know how to write about that anymore because religion journalism has been decimated over the years, George. So many of the uh, stars of uh, religion reporting in the secular press have either retired or they've lost their jobs. Ruth Gledhill, for instance, who was the, one of the mainstays at the Times of London for years, mm -hmm. was let go and and she's got basically been replaced by teenagers and she's fortunately wound up the tablet the catholic publication in the uk but the quality is just dreadful washington post had a story why does Meghan markle have to be baptized and confirmed and their answer was well she had to be confirmed in order for her to receive holy communion at the wedding because the church of england requires that you be confirmed in the church of england to receive communion in the church of england well that's new wow okay all right write that yeah, down that's <laughs> Well, Kevin, it's not true. I know. Okay. Fake uh, news. <laughs> it's fake news. Uh, it's But the thing is, it's written in the Washington Post, so it's got to be true. Now, and my favorite awful though story is the one I saw in the Weekly Standard. Now, the Weekly Standard is a weekly political magazine, and 
I've always thought it that must be pretty good, but now I've read something that I actually know something about that they've covered. So I'm wondering what else yes, is wrong God. with that magazine. <laughs> the Weekly Standard had an article about how Meghan Markle is going to save the Church of England. Oh, wait, save? Change the Church of England, One, save, save the Church of England. Wow. Whatever it is, she is it, man. You know, forget fresh expressions, forget revival. It's Meghan Markle. <laughs> who's going to do the trick for the flagging attendance of the Church of England. Oxford, are you paying attention? This is, you need to know this. Wow. And, and I read this article, and the, the writer is intelligent. Her verbs and adjectives and nouns all line up in grammatical correct order, but the facts that she's trying to present are so out of... I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, It's frustrating. As I mean, journalists... It, religion journalists, it's very frustrating for us to read secular journalism try to tackle religion. It's, um, it's, but, no, uh, you know, uh, that's what we're going to talk today. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, just one little, t you know, like hundreds of little, it didn't get anything major wrong, like saying that Meghan Markle was a Satanist or something. I mean, not something wrong like that, but rather just the accumulation of, building upon ignorance upon ignorance upon mistake upon assumption upon ignorance michael curry is a preacher is a southern preacher michael curry's from buffalo you can't get any farther north than buffalo except if you go to alaska well uh, there might be some people out there in anglican world which we, we have a global audience who don't know that uh, the presiding bishop of the episcopal church has been asked to give the address at the wedding of Harry and Meghan. And it was big news. Gavin and I kind of covered it last week. I thought George and I could cover it again this week because you look at it as news and we're happy for the Episcopal Church. We're happy for uh, Bishop Michael Curry. But we have more information because we've talked uh, talking. We've talked to some people recently on both sides of the issue. And I thought we would you know, talk about kind of what this means globally and what type of cards are being played behind our back. Uh, first off, this is big for the Episcopal Church, George. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, is, this is as good as it gets, I'm, I've got to tell you. This is the sort of the PR bonus that just makes Neva Ray Fox's day. Gives her a lot of work. <laughs> yes, She's does. the press officer at 815, very Do, competent, very, professional. Does a woman. great job. Uh, we love Neva. But this was, you know, talking to people, uh, and I did not talk to Never Ray Fox, so I'm not, don't anybody assume, make that assumption, but talking to people in and around the presiding bishop's office, bishops of the Episcopal Church, leaders of the Episcopal Church, this came as a surprise. The, um, it has been reported in the British press that the couple did not know Michael Curry. So it someone made the choice to invite Michael Curry to be the preacher. Now, it's sort of interesting in that until prayer book reform, you didn't have sermons at weddings, but gosh, now they do. But, so for our prayer book society friends, you could be up in arms about that. But Michael Curry was asked by somebody, some, no, was asked by Kensington Palace to be the preacher, and they're delighted. This is an honor. This is neat. This is exciting. But the questions are, who asked, who was the one who suggested Kensington Palace make this request? And what is the meaning behind the request? And there are different meanings for different audiences. There, and there are definite messages being laid and sent out to the Episcopal Church, to the Church of England, to the wider Anglican Communion by who we think is the instigator of well, let's set this up. Uh, after the wedding this summer, the uh, Episcopal Church is having a general convention. Uh, Texas, right? Yeah, Texas. Uh, Austin, Houston, wherever. And at that general convention, they're going to discuss whether or not they want to introduce changes in the prayer book uh, for marriage. Take out man, take out women, add some colorful words, maybe take out Holy Spirit. You know, make it more contemporary more societal approved and in that is the ability to maybe split the church again maybe have the remaining conservative diocese say hey we're going acna we're out of here and 
it would be really behoove Michael Curry to negotiate going forward, uh, both sides here. And I've heard rumors he's been meeting with the conservative bishops. Oh, they're not rumors. They're true. Okay. Um, the uh, there is, as Bishop Dan Martins of Springfield has pointed out, there is uh, the potential for disruption of the Episcopal Church if prayer book revision is takes place that enforces all dioceses that do not permit same-sex marriage to have it in their prayer book. Uh, Central Florida, Florida, Albany, Dallas, uh, probably about 15 or 20 who have basically said this is a line we're not going to cross. Mm -hmm. Right now we're in a the New Zealand church has adopted our model, or we're following the New Zealand model, which is local diocesan option. Sure. We'll stick together, but we're agreed to be disagree. We agree to disagree, and we're not going to force you if you don't force us. That's where we are today. And for the conservatives in the Episcopal Church, they can live with that right now. Now, the liberals want to do away with that. The Standing Commission on Liturgy wants to do away with that local option by compelling all dioceses to accept gay marriage. Now that's a problem as Bishop Dan Martins has written on his blog extensively. Part of this commission process, if you remember folks, was Bill Nye, not the science guy, the but guy. the but the secretary of the Archbishop's Council of the Church of England wrote a letter to the Episcopal Church saying don't make, take this step, don't go there, because this separating procreation from marriage, for instance, or making it gender neutral really is a bad move theologically, pastorally, liturgically, so on and so forth. You know, Kevin and George, you're really making a leap here. You're telling us that General Convention has something to do with the invitation of uh, presiding Bishop Michael Curry to give the address at Harry and Meghan's uh, nuptials tomorrow? Yeah, yes. because oh, just because a moment. Why? <laughs> why? Well, t according to senior conservative Episcopalians, who they view this as well be saying to Michael Curry, look, see what you will lose if you go over the edge. We had the stick in, Bill N in William Nye's letter. Now we have the carrot in Justin well, these invitations. When you say book. lose, see what you will lose if you guys force the prayer book. Force right. the prayer book. Okay. Right. You will not be part of the show and the pageantry. You won't have all this fun. You won't get the good seats. You won't be included in. You won't have Shepard Smith at Fox News drooling all over you about how wonderful the service is. Michael Curry is going to be preaching a sermon on marriage. What is the issue facing the Episcopal Church? Marriage. marriage. Yeah. What is the issue facing uh, the wider communion? Marriage, gay or straight or gender neutral. So the conservatives see that in the Episcopal Church see this as a basically a a gift to Curry to encourage him to keep the Episcopal Church in line. Now, my English sources uh, are of two minds. There's, as Gavin has spoken about this, this is an open invitation to the liberals to go even crazier. Others who I've spoken to says are saying that, well, wait and see what Curry says. Michael Curry is an advocate for same-sex marriage. If he toes the line at this wedding, it will be a signal that that Justin Welby will allow you to be locally crazy, but will expect you to toe the line internationally nationally in other words here are the boundaries that are being set you'll still be on you'll still be invited into the club if you personally believe in gay marriage but if your public statements are pro-traditional marriage and that's great and good that's how well we plays the game uh, as Gavin mentioned you know we're not changing our doctrine well, we said that we're not going to change our prayer book we're not going to change any of the articles we're not going to change what we say we believe however by the behind the scenes is chaos in the church of england um we talked about all the uh, uh deans that are being the gay deans that are being promoted uh within the church of england uh which gavin's noted so you do one thing publicly but behind the scenes you have a completely different agenda and i think this is part of welby's agenda yeah and we well what is welby's agenda 
I'll sit, tell you what I think it is, which is not the same thing as what Welby may think it <laughs> no. is. But I have said many times, I have been very harshly critical of Justin Welby on this program many times. Uh, I have uh, even questioned, I've even said I don't believe the way he seems to believe. I have never once said he's a stupid man. He's not. He's a very bright man. He's he is a very successful corporate intriguer and infighter. And if you look at this as the Church of England as being a huge, massive corporation with differing eddies and currents and flows within that sea, Welby is the master of always winding up on top. In other words, Welby wants to be whichever group is at the majority, he's part of that group too. And his firm goal is to preserve the institution. That that precludes taking ideological stances, meaning either for or against gay marriage. It's like the new Bishop of London. She will not give an opinion other than puppy dog, sweetness, love, and happiness because she's waiting for Justin Welby to say which way to jump. And Justin Welby is saying, we're not going to make a statement which way to jump because we need to keep the conservatives and we need to keep the liberals all on board. So Welby's, I, I, to take it back to the, the royal wedding, Welby is going to be spending the weekend with Michael Curry at, when's at you know before the wedding. Sure. And I firmly believe that part of this will be, gosh, I really hear what you're saying about gay marriage. Oh, man, I really have, really am proud of the stance you're taking, but you know, we're just not there yet. Okay. So can you just make a deal to allow the conservatives to be conservative because you know it'll help me here in the Church of England it'll not create any more problems it'll suck all the oxygen out of GAFCON and out of uh, the conservative movement if we play the code of tolerance and in, and be obscure that's what I believe but ironic. I could, I, and, and I and I will guarantee you that I'm wrong on a lot of it <laughs> no 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 well, I, there's some it's a bit ironic because uh, they did that exact program was tried in England and slowly they just got rid of all the conservatives there's no more uh, uh, I mean, uh, Nazarales there's no more uh, conservative bishops being brought into office anywhere within the Church of England and so this long game this just wait wait it out one day we'll have the votes to do it our way eventually takes place yeah. Kevin, I think we need to, though, to say that, yes, the conservative, uh, I don't want to say ideologues, but those for whom uh, whom we in an American context would recognize as being Episcopal material, mm -hmm. men and women of integrity or, or men of integrity, and in the Episcopal Church, men and women of integrity and character and intelligence mm -hmm. and charisma, that's not the model in the Church of England. They are not electing Gene Robinsons and Jack Spongs. They, in the 1980s, they had far more crazy liberal bishops than they have today. They're electing careerists mm -hmm. and non-entities. They're now 15 women bishops, and they run sort of the gamut. But they are all identical in the sense of being institutionalists. The Bishop of Bristol, who is a, a, frankly a dreadful administrator and a bully and pastorally incompetent, she's 63 years old, meaning she's only got five, six years to be bishop. She's been given a plum before retirement and will be, and she can say all she wants about how I'm personally in favor of gay marriage, but I bet you she will toe the line and follow whatever the boss says. So the Church of England is not putting forward liberal or conservative uh, true believers. They're putting forward mediocre people. Middle man. And I know. And see, here's some of the joke. Uh, London now has a, a woman bishop, Sarah Mulally, and she has announced that she's going to go to all the ordinations, including those for the conservative evangelicals and the uh, forward and faith Anglo Catholics. Uh, which 
wow. is uh, going to be a bit of a problem. Now, they have a flying bishop for London, the Bishop of Fulham. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the problem with the Bishop of Fulham. The Bishop of Fulham, who's supposed to be the bishop for conservatives, voted in support of the uh, gay marriage proposals in the, uh, I forget which report it was, and he's divorced, he's the first divorced and remarried bishop in the Church of England. And one of, and he is supposed to have a pastoral and Episcopal oversight for those clergy who are opposed to, to remarriage after divorce. And he's the first bishop to be divorced and remarried. In other words, this man, he's also a Freemason too, but I don't mean to pick the beat on the guy. But the, the point is that the bishops who they have, even those you can tinge as conservative or liberal, very few, very few have spines. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. There are no J.C. Riles in the in the Church of England anymore. Haven't been for a while. Now, there are I'm no George Bells in the Episcopal in the Church of England. And like George, in other words, George Bell stood up during the Second World War and protested the bombing of Germany. George Bell housed Jewish refugee children fleeing from the Nazis before the war. You don't have bishops like that anymore. You have bishops that go with whatever the political chattering classes think is best. Yeah, that's true. And being pro-Jewish and bring anti-bombing was not what the smart people thought in the 40s and 30s. All right, I want to move to a different topic because I know you suffer this problem and I suffer the same problem. I come from a crazy family. I, I, I need to admit it right now. My mom and dad and all my aunts and uncles all the way down and myself included we're all crazy and so when i see people like the royals the the markles get together i have great appreciation for that chaos that a new family brings into marriage george kind of fun to watch huh no no it's not <laughs> It just amazes me. Uh, well, first of all, the press is is posting every possible uh, corner story on, on on this wedding, and I don't think anybody here in America has the appreciation for what the British press are really like, George. Uh, just think of the National Enquirer on. St just think of uh, a combination of Shepard Smith. In, uh, and Anderson Cooper in terms of hysteria and the National Enquirer in terms of uh, journalistic integrity and you have the British press and six over competing papers all within the city of London uh, fighting for each person to read um, their paper it, it is amazing George I want to thank you for, I'm sorry Laurel I want to thank you for a wonderful show I can and and Yanni, don't we need to talk about raising funds? Oh yeah, we need Gafcon. some a, a couple extra bucks for our trip to Gafcon three. Um, let's see, probably I don't know how much, but if you could go to Anglican dot inc forward slash donate, probably need an extra six hundred dollars. Uh, it'd be very helpful if you could help us out there. Also, and I forgot the most important part. You know, it's, it's written here. The, the number one thing I was going to talk about was like, share, comment, and subscribe. People, this is your chance now to participate in this uh, 24 minutes of doldrum that you just listened to. You can like it. Please like it. Even if you didn't like it, like it. Because that helps Google with their search engine. And it, it brings us more pr prominently into the, the world of Anglicanism. Share it more and more you're getting braver i see people sharing this on facebook and i'm like you guys wow brave cool please comment now we had 28 comments uh this week with gavin's program uh talking about uh, and, and two letters of <laughs> cease and desist from lawyers yeah, that's right it's talking about polytechnical institutes <laughs> so the fun comments there and subscribe the only way you're going to find out if there's a new anglican unscripted is to click subscribe I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 396 of Anglican Unscripted.